Gran Turismo 7 Review, Part 2. I knew I would need to make a Part 2 before I even made Part 1. So, in Gran Turismo 7 Review, Part 1, it was 13 days after launch I'd been playing on PS4. Now, it's over 20 weeks after launch I've played on PS4 and PS5 for a combined 300 and something hours. I can compare the two versions now. I think I know pretty thoroughly all the features and flaws of Gran Turismo 7, and there's things I didn't have in Part 1, some things I didn't get around to, and a lot more things that no review could have mentioned around launch because they've changed. There's been bug fixes, patches, updates. Let's go through it all. Was your favourite part of GT4 sitting on the grid for a minute uh, and then restarting and then doing the same thing again when you couldn't pass the one lap magic missions? Well, if it was, GT7 has those as well. So they're not as hard, not as deviously impossible as they were in GT4. This one was pretty tough and I won it by the most narrow margin possible. Well, pretty much. I mean, come on. I overtook three frames before the end, but anyway. I'm Snake of Bacon and tonight I'm going through all the courses and Suzuki's added to Gran Turismo 7 in April, May and June, as well as other cars, other features, the differences between PS4 and PS5, the wonderful parts of this game that keep me coming back and the bits that make me scratch my head and go, why, why on earth, whose idea, what, wh I really love the end bit with the organ. Goosebumps every time. Alright, yeah, review, part two, here we go. Gran Turismo 7 is 60 FPS on PS4 and PS5, but since PS5 has 60 FPS share footage, I can actually show you this time. And that's wonderful. The game looks beautiful sitting still, and it looks even better once you get moving. One thing I wasn't expecting to see is the same on PS4 and PS5, is that the rocks and waterfall that your eye is drawn to on Deep Forest, they change shadow maps as you approach them, still. It seems that they change shape or colour, but no, it's just the shadows, but it's so, so noticeable, since it's so eye-catching. Just like how in Daytona, on the horizon, the lampposts still fade in in groups as you approach them. That's of little consequence. More important is the size of the giant sequoias. They dwarf the track marsh... Okay, that's not important. Back on the 17th of March, 2022, or St. Patrick's Day, I was working on GT7 Review Part 1, and I found out that that evening, the update that was coming was reducing many of the game's event payouts, making the already terrible grind dreadful. There was also an issue with the patch that PD didn't catch until quite late in the process, an issue so severe they had to shut the entire server down, making the game unplayable for over 24 hours for everyone in the world. They then issued a replacement patch, an apology letter, and gave all the affected players 1 million credits. Now, in this game, 1 million credits, depending on how you spend it, uh, could buy you lots of tyres, or not quite a car. But I must redact what I said before about a Mura in part 1. I thought it would be, once again, a car that you could look at and want, but not acquire because it would be about 15 million credits. I was totally wrong. They've dropped the price from 15 million in GT5, 6 and Sport down to just 2.5 million. At its cheapest, these cars are dynamically priced, so the next time it came around it was 3.4 million, but uh, it's no longer the 4th or 5th most expensive car in the game, but the 26th. There are much worse grinds ahead. But hey, at least that car has gone down in price. As to what's gone up, the GDM heroes of the late 80s through early 2000s that Gran Turismo is built on are no longer priced based on what they were worth new, but what they're worth today in mint condition at auction. And the models in Gran Turismo aren't just sports cars, they're the very rarest variants of these cars. There's only 718 V-Spec tuners in the world, only 140 of that NSX were made. 1500 or so of the RX-7 and the Super RZ, I don't know how many thousand were made, but it's safe to say they're basically extinct in the wild. You know, have you ever seen a clean Super RZ? Only in Gran Turismo. All the others have been modified to hell. Speaking of modification, did you know you can get a wide body for the Lamborghini Mura? But then you'd have to buy another one, because you can't undo the wide body, so... Maybe when I get a second mirror, I could do that. I don't know what I'd do with a wide body mirror. That's a weird idea. Um, back on topic, though, 
All those price increases mean nothing compared to the McLaren F1 going from 1 million to 18 million 500,000. And worse, like the Mura, it's dynamically priced in the Legend car dealership and went up by the same amount, 900k in the second rotation. So 19.4 million. Here's a crudely drawn graph illustrating how the price was steady at a million, then jumped to 18.5 million, then 19.4 just to rub it in. 416 of the game's cars, or 96% of the list, is priced under the first grey line. It's lunacy how these prices are going up. You can't even get a cappuccino for under 15 grand these days, just like in Sydney cafes. Yeah, one of the first three cars added via an update was the Suzuki Cappuccino, but we're not up to that yet. That was at the end of April. Before that, they had to fix some problems with the game's economy. Regarding grinding, in the blog post from the 18th of March, director Yamauchi-san wrote, if possible, I would like to try to avoid a situation where a player must mechanically keep replaying certain events over and over again. So in the major economy update on the 7th of April, they added three events. This one in particular, most players have been playing over and over again, mechanically, because it makes more money than everything else and has for the last 104 days. It's a bit tricky at first. It took me a while to get used to it. Seeking more control than I had in that Diablo, I tried out an A45 AMG that I'd won on the wheel. I went about modifying it, giving it a wider stance, and painting it like an angry Jaffa. I added three family-sized bags of Jaffas to the car to make it a bit heavier, to get under 600pp. Had no luck with it. Also had no luck with the NSX, um, just because it's cursed. But I've won the event with 15 or so other cars. The other big economy change was the addition of big credit-based incentives for circuit experience and they're retroactive too. If you'd already done Circuit Experience, you'd go back and claim hundreds of thousands to millions of credits for it. I would have done Fisherman's Ranch Circuit Experience anyway, because I love the track. But at launch, they would give you 72,000 credits for doing this. Now you get 72,000 plus 600,000 plus 2 million, and that's more like it. That is only a one-time lump sum payout though. The same update did ameliorate the payout for that one event from 30,000 to 42,000, but that's still down a lot from the 65,000 it was at launch. As of the April 7th update, and still over 103 days later, as I'm speaking, the second fastest way to make money is at Le Mans in the half hour race for 700pp, which is a lot easier than Tokyo and you can do it in nearly any car. Like this, the Alpine or Alpine A220, a car that didn't have much success at Le Mans in 1968, so it had its long tail removed and went rallying. As the game's description would tell you, they didn't mention it was tarmac rallies only and you can't put dirt tyres on it, but it's still a really good car. What's not really good is when you're about to win the race by a large margin with a few seconds left and forget that the finish line is really close and, and not under this gantry where I thought it was, that's the start line, and now I have to go to another lap and oh well, I'll be back in about five minutes. For those who don't want to use rain tyres or have uncertainty about how many laps are going to be in the race, the Sardinia World Touring Cars 800. 727,500 credits for 15 laps. The amount is burned into my head. There has been so little else to do for the last 100 days. This is still the third best paying event. I don't know why I get such special treatment. There are harder races that pay less than a quarter as much per hour. Also, uh, the AI cannot see you coming out of the pit lanes, which is a bit frustrating. Also frustrating, nay, maddening, is the fact that if you're playing with the HUD off, oh, you can't select any pit options. And once you're in the pit, you can't pause the game to turn it back on. So I learned that the hard way. Rolled in to the pit lane and the crew said, hey, what tires do you want? Hey, hey, what tires do you want? We can't put them on. Um, okay, you get no tyres, have some fuel. Great, wonderful. I can't stop the fuel going in. Um, or maybe I can, maybe there's an invisible button somewhere. But, um, I needed a full tank anyway. But come on, what a ridiculous feature, or lack thereof. This could be so easily solved with a HUD on-off mapped to the controller, or just the ability to pause in a pit stop. You also can't adjust display settings while you're in a sport mode race. So if you forget to change back from this mode in the warm-up, when you go to settings, you only get assist settings, not display, so I can't turn the HUD back on. The third way to make money introduced in the economy updates, besides grinding and circuit experience, is the Human Comedy, a set of eight one-hour endurance races in the missions tab. 
Since these are missions and not standard races, they're extra challenging. Although, I found Kyoto pretty easy in the Radical because you don't need to pit. But all the other ones are very, very hard. And worst of all, for how difficult they are, you only get paid for them once if you win. I mean, there are bronze, silver and gold prizes. You get gold, you get all three. If I get bronze and come back and get silver, and then come back and get gold, I will have gotten the same amount of money if I got gold the first time, so I would feel like I just wasted hours by not being good enough to pass it first try. Oh, and it pays less per hour than the easy Le Mans race, so difficult, unrewarding, and no replayability. What a combo. When you want to stop making money and start having fun, you can drift whatever you like around Tsukuba. Even a SIL-80. Even a Citroën DS3. Actually, no, it's a DS Automobiles DS3. Please don't try and drift. It's front wheel drive. It just doesn't work. You can even drift the AE86 Shuichi Shigeno Edition, which has a lot more power, an air-conditioned cup holder, an analog dash, and an air-conditioned cup holder. What a genius invention. Go Tofu. Also, look at this dirt. This is on PS4, too. I mean, the last few clips have been on PS4, but wow, that dirt. Little specks of dirt and sparks. Great sparks as always, they look better in 60 FPS. Let's get some PS5 footage going, because it's time for what happened in the late April update. This is unrelated, but PS5 Bathurst! Yeah, 60 FPS Bathurst replays! So good. And the Pennzoil GTR! Useless in Group 3 as it turns all of its fuel into backfire, but oh, that backfire. Um, backfires keep changing in updates, I don't think it does that anymore. But it did, for a little while, on PS4 at least. And now, the April content update. They added Spa. We already had Spa, but this is the Spa 24-hour layout. Which has a full 24-hour day-night cycle, and the other Spa does not, for whatever reason. You can only play at night on the Spa 24-hour layout, which is different because the start line is in a different place. That's right, it's over there. And... The pit lane is different. Same entry point, but the exit is a lot further away. You bypass Eau Rouge. You, you drive a very long way down the side of the track. You've got the endurance pit lane. That's the difference. You can test it out in this endurance race. The one hour spa event is the longest repeatable event in the game. Unless you make a custom race that pays nothing. But this one you actually get 1.5 million credits for. Unless you overtake on a yellow. Sure, you get a three second penalty. The real penalty is that you miss out on half a million extra credits. It voids the clean race bonus. Oh, don't do that. Also, it rains pretty heavily. Bring wets and intermediates. Now, that was level three of rain for a moment. Now two. Now one. What the heck are the other four levels of rain? I've seen tiny patches of green and yellow on the radar for a few seconds in custom race, but I imagine the top two would end the world. As for the cars that came with Spa, it's the Suzuki Cappuccino. If you want to be specific, it's the EA11R model, which doesn't produce as much torque as the EA21R, which had a later K6A engine, but the F6A was also used by the Mazda Auto Zam AZ1, and revs slightly higher. The second car in the update is a Subaru BRZ. Oh, how fun they are to drift. Now, I have to be specific, because the game has quite a few BRZs. It's a 2021. BRZ, you know, the second generation, same as the GR86. Wonderful car, even if it is kind of a duplicate. The third car is also a type of Subaru BRZ, but first, a feature that was added in the other April update, temporary exposure correction. Now you can fiddle around with the exposure without changing any of your TV settings or the in-game brightness and exposure settings, just so you can appreciate the stars more. Or if the sun's too bright, or if your car's interior is too dark. It's just a handy thing to have on the pause menu straight away, because that's something you need to change every now and then. But this car, it's not just another BRZ. This is the 2021 BRZ GT300 that won the Super GT in Japan. That Don't you just love these AI? Thank you very much for spinning me out. As I was going to say, it's the first Subaru to win a Super GT championship, and it is not powered by the same engine as every other BRZ. It's got an EJ20 up the front like a WRX STI. And I simply must show you, I did claw my way back up to victory. Barely. Thank you, Subaru. And before we move forward, I just remembered that early April economy update also doubled the amount of cars on sale, or car slots, I should say, since there's always some sold out, at the used car dealership from 15 to 30, 
and of a legend car dealership from just 5 on sale at once to 10. They also increased the cap on earned credits from 20 million to 100 million at once, so you don't have to completely bankrupt yourself if you've saved up to buy that wonderful Alfa Romeo. Of course, do remember, you still have to win this race 24 times in a row without spending any money. Or you could grind for... Are you right, mate? You could do 288 laps of Tokyo East. Or you could win 10,000 credits on the roulette 2,000 times. Or a million 20 times, that's not happening. Or you could just buy 2 million credit packs at 29.95 a apiece. 10 of those, that's Australian dollars. 299.50 in exchange for the credits to buy one of the game's most expensive cars to save 12 hours of grinding. Leaving the door open for people with addiction problems to throw away $1,198 and get four cars, when they could have gotten groceries for five or six weeks. I understand paying money to get content, but there's a huge difference between charging money for a paid DLC expansion and letting players convert an unlimited amount of their real money into in-game money. The latter is heinous and exploitative, and just because all the big publishers are doing it and getting away with it, doesn't mean it should be normalised. I don't want Gran Turismo 8 to be like Star Citizen. Anyway, how about... The May Content Update! My favourite feature added in the May update was photo export, something the game desperately needed. Especially on PS4, if you had a 1080p TV, you couldn't move 4K photos off the game, well, besides doing something really complicated with the Gran Turismo website. Now, you simply export each photo, individually, unfortunately, and it saves the original JPEG to your PS4 or PS5's screenshots folder. Then you plug a USB flash drive in and do whatever you like with them. Stick a whole bunch together in paint.net, make a thumbnail, whatever you like. As for cars arriving in May, wow, they finally added the Rampage Camaro by Roadster Shop. The 1970 Camaro GoPro, oh, they took the GoPro, whatever. Roadster Shop Rampage. It won the SEMA Show Gran Turismo Award in November 2014, and it was announced then it would come to Gran Turismo at a later date. Well, May 2022 is a later date. The May update, or possibly the one before, also added startup sounds for every car, so you can hear it roar. See, uh, it was a 1970 Camaro, but then it fell into a lot of carbon fibre parts and an LS7 and, um, I mean, it's, it's a race car, show car, track day car thing. And while we're talking about cars that won the SEMA Show Gran Turismo Award, the other one added to GT7 from launch, the Wicked Fabrication GT. As you can see, it has trafficators on the sides. No other car in GT has trafficators. Back to cars added in May, how about the Toyota GR010 Hybrid, the Le Mans Hypercar that I only bought very recently because it's 3 million credits, that's not cheap. Also, after playing for this long, the collector level is really dumb. Not only are there almost no rewards, you get to 50 and then there's still 350 million credits more cars to get. So, how is the Toyota GR010, Gro10, whatever it is? Well, it's fast. Of course it's fast, it's a Le Mans prototype. Well, it's not. It's a Le Mans hypercar. It's a new class, they're a bit bigger and heavier, uh, and supposedly less fast than they used to be, but I couldn't tell. Uh, cool thing is, with this car and other single-seaters, when you switch to offset camera, it doesn't actually offset the camera, it just gives you a wider field of view, which should be an option for all cars, but anyway, it looks quite nice. They added some events in this update, including for the Group 1 cars in the form of bonus cafe books. Yeah, bonus, as if it was actually finished to begin with. It really isn't, but anyway, in this bonus book, you have some Group 1 events that are pretty difficult. Mostly because you start an extremely long way behind first place, and it's very easy to spin out in these cars. This race in particular had a few problems, because at Circuit de saint Croix, yeah, that wasn't a cut. You teleport out of the pit lane into the middle of the road. It's, um, yeah, they fixed that later, but boy, that's... A problem. The race at Daytona is not too bad as long as you install a big turbo to have lots of power. The race at Suzuka is a nightmare. I only won because I brought a superior super formula car and it rained so much that everyone spun out. I parked to avoid a yellow flag penalty but still got one for passing someone who was in a sand trap. Um, not that it matters because the payouts for these events are really low. They finally added some events for K-Cars, which should have been much earlier in the campaign, but oh well. 
they don't pay particularly well these events so you do them once and then the, that's those few minutes done you're back to the grind at Tokyo and Le Mans this is the only race they've added for Lago Maggiore East End and it's really cool to see the pit crews waving over the barrier never saw that before I didn't see it because there were no races at this layout until now there are dozens of layouts in the game that still have no events for them and heaps of other tracks that have only a couple cars are really not well utilized either like, there are so many cars that have very few uses the vision gt cars were among them and now this may update added a vision gt set of races just three events and they're all set for 850 pp so you bring a car with about that much whether it's the audi or the lambo or the lexus lflc and then fly to the front overtaking a bunch of much much slower cars until you get to the few that are almost as quick as you but this isn't a race what is this fashion week like i'm just overtaking a bunch of cars that are, shouldn't even be racing with me why couldn't they just make one make racing series for each vgt that make one for the mercedes make one for the lambo make some events for the dodge tomahawk why it hurts my head that Suzuki I overtook was the third car added this month, a Suzuki BGT. Real surprise. Um, there's no events that it's good for. At 600 PP, it's just too light and not powerful enough to win that one grinding race at Tokyo. So what can you do with it? Hot lap around Tsukuba, I guess. Not much else it's really good for. Great car, no use for it. Moving on. The June content update. The most welcome surprise of a 32 Ford, a classic choice for hot rodding. And as this one was modified throughout the 50s and 60s, even its modifications are classic. It's a classic modified classic. And wonderful. There are no cars like it in GT, so heaps of fun to have it. Ford purists be warned, it does have a Chrysler engine. But it's still cool enough to be in the Henry Ford Museum. The other car added is something truly amazing so special it is the suzuki escudo pikes peak yes yeah, scudo Woo! finally a car to smash the three minute barrier at fisherman's ranch it is a joy to have it back the monster the legend made famous by nobuhiro monster tajima and of course gran turismo 2 3 4 and 5 and 6 now that it's been gloriously remodeled and added to GT7, you too can fly around in a 980 horsepower Suzuki. Yes, fly. It jumped 95 meters. What a wonderful car. You know, a track was added in this update too. So of course, as soon as I saw that silhouette of the Suzuki, I thought, well, they've been sponsoring the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb for the last seven years, and this June was the 100th running of the event, but no, it actually was not Pikes Peak, it was Watkins Glen. <laughs> Very unexpected, but yeah, great. Of course, I'm a little bit disappointed that it's not Pikes Peak, but Watkins Glen is a wonderful track. I know it well from NASCAR 2000. We go. We're at Watkins Glen International for today's NASCAR race. What a difference 22 years makes. And the track is still very much the same. Although now it says go bowling. But oh, and you can rotate the chase camera now? That was a feature I did not expect. Also, honking makes a return. Honking. This changes everything. We still can't communicate through quick messages like in sport, but at least we can honk at each other now to communicate. There were plenty of other little changes in June. The garage no longer defaults to one sorting method, it remembers the last one you used. The ghosts can be loaded again. <laughs> Months of only being able to save ghosts and not load them, it's ridiculous. And, of course, the Suzuki Vision GT Group 3 car was added. So now Suzuki can enter the manufacturer series. And, you know, it's good. Don't stop the Suzukis now. How about a Jimny? How about a Wagon R Double R? Yes, that's Leonardo DiCaprio. How about someone tell me why Dragon Trail Gardens gets rain, but Seaside doesn't? Or, no, no, speaking of rain, how about someone explain to me how it could be blowing west 5.2 metres a second, but the rain's moving east a kilometre a second, or Mach 3? 
I'm confused by what's going on with the campaign of this game. In May they added bonus menus. In June they added extra menus. These extra ones do not have any races attached. You just come back when you have all three cars. Naturally by this point I already had every cheap car in the game. So I set about collecting my rewards. Roulette tickets in this case and of course beautiful scenes of the cars in real time with ray tracing and all that fancy stuff as they tell you a little bit of history and you admire the brake lights. The rotary engine collection gives you a six star ticket that is a guaranteed engine swap. Finally! I'd logged in every day for over 110 days in search of an engine swap since you can only win them on the roulette wheel. To be finally guaranteed one was a huge relief. I'd rather not play a cruel game of chance to win an engine. I'd much rather just buy them from some sort of engine shop. I don't know why they didn't implement that. Maybe they will in the future. Especially because there was a little bit of a glitch with the June update that meant you could claim the rewards for all of these extra menus more than once. In fact, you could claim them as many times as you liked for over a week. Now I have quite a lot of engines, things from the 4-star tickets, odd parts, and a lot of Honda Group B cars, but mainly I have a 2JZ powered GR Yaris. No, more than that, I have a Honda Civic powered Mini. It's uncontrollable and it's going to kill me, but it's wonderful. I have a Toyota Tundra with the heart of a GT500 car, a lethally overpowered V8 Silvia. And after many, many attempts and many duplicates, I finally got myself the GTR Nismo engine I wanted, so I could go put it in a Lancia Delta. You can do that. What will they do about this situation now, I wonder? Now that some players have dozens or hundreds of engines, and those who missed out, well, how will they ever get themselves a 964-powered Beetle? Will they perhaps add engines to the used car dealership, or the ability to buy a car and remove the engine? I don't know. I hope they do something, something other than roulette. So far, that's about it for updates. I'd penciled in that I wanted to release this video around the 97 or 100 day mark, so I'm a lot later than I wanted to be, but at least I could tell you about everything that happened in the June updates, since there was so much to catalogue. In fact, it took me so long that the July update is happening in just a few days, and we'll add three more cars to the game. For a while I thought we were just in the early stages, just getting a few three packs and then we'd get something more like five, six, seven. Some early updates for GT Sport added 11 cars, but it looks more and more like we'll just be getting three cars a month consistently. It's not really a lot, 36 cars a year is a lot less than people might have hoped for, since GT Sport added over 80 in its first year, over 60 in its second year, although then it did dry up. If GT Sport added three cars a month, its last update would have come out this year, although we probably all would have gone mad waiting for it. <laughs> Imagine if Laguna Seek was just added to GT Sport in January. Anyway, there's wonderful things in GT7, like stretching an Alfa Romeo Mito, giving it a wide body, putting on some WRC rims. Yes, why not turn an Alfa Romeo Mito into a rally kit car? Why not paint it to look like Neapolitan ice cream? Badly. I really haven't mastered the Gran Turismo livery editor. I can't make things parallel most of the time. I just... The projection, it's a tricky thing to work out. Still, absolutely worth it. I love this Alfa Romeo. What a wonderful beast I've made. And I love that almost nothing from sport was lost. I mean, I would be really sad to see these rally tracks go. I'm sad already that they haven't added a snow track, but I would miss... Sardinia windmills. About as much as I miss Toscana, although not quite as much as I miss Eiger Nordwand and Chamonix. GT7 has every single car from Sport except for the Mercedes F1 W08 and the Fittipaldi EF7 Vision GT. And three cars that were just livery duplicates, but anyway, it has all of those cars plus 100 that were not in Sport. And there's a lot of newly remodeled ones, both new to the series and very old PS2 cars that have been completely remade. There's a lot of premium models from GT5 and 6 as well. Like the famous Lamborghini Murcielago, or Lamborghini Murcielago if you insist. It's a beautiful car, and it always has been. In GT5 and 6 it had this amazing high poly model that is mostly the same here, and I know because look at the engine. That's an embarrassment, because that's the engine from the GT5 and 6 gameplay model. 
So, and this is a phone on a TV, but you can tell that's the same little textured box called an engine. But in those games, when it was time to take a replay photo, it would switch to the pretty engine, the one that was modelled really, really nicely. And it doesn't load the pretty engine in photo mode in Gran Turismo 7 on PS5? What is up with that? The good engine's still there, but only in the garage. Why? And what's the hold up with the other 160 odd premium cars? Where's the LFA? And the Mark 6 Golf R, I guess. No, but really, where's the LFA? And where's Apricot Hill? Give them to us. Look at the XJ13's phenomenal engine, in gameplay. Why doesn't the Lamborghini use its pretty engine? I don't get it. Also, what's up with the XJ13's mirror? Using a high resolution 20 FPS reflection where you can see your helmet, unlike every other mirror in the game. I don't, I don't get that. There's a lot I don't get. I don't get why we still can't have Monza at night when Ride 3 does it. Come on, Ride 3 has Monza at night. That's great. Why can't Gran Turismo? When will Gran Turismo? have Monza at night. And motorbikes. Seriously, Tourist Trophy 2, can someone make it happen? GT7 had a rocky launch. Sport mode has gotten better since then. It's mostly reverted back to Group 4 and Group 3 races, with the occasional bring your own garage car event, although they've been a little bit better balanced thanks to actually using the performance point system. The players are still about the same. I guess no one really learned about sportsmanship and doing things that don't make you look bad. To wrap this all up for now, GT7 is still a wonderful game for doing time trials, just as GT Sport was. Which isn't saying very much, because of course the time trials are good. It's supposed to be the real driving simulator. The driving is excellent, as they state. The cars are excellent and beautiful. The amount of content is a bit lacking, but it's really the features that are extremely poor and need the most work. You still cannot sell cars. There is still a campaign that is extremely short. I finished it in the first 14 days and for the rest of the time I've been stuck with the nightmarish economy where you are a slave to four events that can make you money. Watkins Glen is a very welcome addition as it's the first all new track in GT7. There are really not very many new roads in this game. We have Alsace Village's Strange Little Sister, four more Lago Maggiore variants, Daytona returning from GT6, the pit lane at Spa, the newly redesigned Trial Mountain, and Deep Forest, and High Speed Ring, which I forgot to draw. In the coming months this will get better, there will be more courses. There will probably be one, if not in a few days, definitely next month another course is coming. There's nothing set in stone saying it'll be Pikes Peak International Hill Climb, even though they've been teasing it for so long. They have a Pikes Peak category where the cars have little hashtags on them. Some say Le Mans, some say WRC, two say Pikes Peak. The Escudo and the Audi Sport Quattro S1 Pikes Peak. That's still no guarantee that the road is coming. The Escudo being in Gran Turismo 3 through 6 didn't mean that the track was promised to be added, the addition of two new Pikes Peak cars to Gran Turismo 6 and the start of Gran Turismo sponsoring the event wasn't even enough to bring the Pikes Peak track to GT6 or GT Sport, so it may not come to GT7 as illogical as that may sound. But even the addition of Pikes Peak wouldn't solve all of Gran Turismo 7's problems, no, for that it needs Red Rock Valley, or seriously, for that it needs a campaign with hundreds more events, more things to do with these cars. I have a deep respect for Polyphony Digital and the works that they have made. Gran Turismo 1 through 4, undeniably masterpieces. Gran Turismo 5 and 6 had a tremendous amount to live up to. And while they knocked it out of the park in the technology department, reaching towards photorealism, they were still resting on the laurels of GT4, borrowing so many of its cars and tracks. And when it was time to give that all up, you got Gran Turismo Sport, the result of culling everything old to focus on the new world of eSports. When GT7 was announced as the most complete Gran Turismo to date, and then released as a game where after the A license you do one five race championship and then get a cake because the game's over, the respect I have is damaged. I know that three people could, in an hour, brainstorm more events than this game has. If they had looked at their own earlier games for inspiration, you'd think they'd see things like qualifying for races, 
grid starts, manufacturer events, long championships where you can save in the middle, endurance races, snow driving, special events. The most complete Gran Turismo to date would have all of that, I'd imagine. When the server went down, the letter said, we would really appreciate it if everyone could watch over the growth of Gran Turismo 7 from a somewhat longer term point of view. That I completely understand. If you just got on this train recently, yes, don't expect these features to magically pop up in the coming days or weeks. Gran Turismo as a series has been in development for 30 years. Like the cleaner says in Toy Story 2, you can't rush art. Unfortunately, it seems that some parts of it were rushed, and some parts of Gran Turismo need to be rushed so it can be released in our lifetimes. I am so glad this game is out, and I can come here to worship the Nürburgring in a 911 GT1 Strassen version in the offset view with the wobble type 2 and the HUD off. That is an amazing experience. But to have these amazing experiences, you still need to find them yourself. The Sophie AI program will not materialize into anything useful for a matter of years. For now, it's as much a pipe dream as the 10,000 square kilometer track editor announced in 2013 for GT6. Gran Turismo 7 is not the be-all and end-all of racing games that the ideal Gran Turismo could be. The single player experience feels like a tutorial for something better yet to arrive. But I'll keep playing the online time trials and checking in on the game so I can make review part 3 in about 3 months or so. See you in three more content updates. Snake of Bacon, signing out.